I'm here to talk to you all about something of a uh, strange combination of issues, um, art and nuclear energy, not two things that usually seem to have um, an obvious relationship, but at this point in my career, I have found myself right at the intersection of these two issues, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I found myself here. So I am the daughter of a nuclear engineer, and when I was about 15 years old, I learned in my biology course that nuclear energy was dangerous and scary and bad. And I was really devastated because I always thought it was pretty neat that my dad was a nuclear engineer. And I went home and I was like, Dad, what have you been doing at work? <laughs> and he was like, oh, OK, so this is what you've learned. And you're really scared, and I understand that. So instead of pulling out an encyclopedia or getting on the internet, he said, let's go explore this. Let's go find out about nuclear energy firsthand. And so we went to the Oconee Nuclear Station in South Carolina, which is actually the power plant that currently powers my home and my office and my work. And I got a Geiger counter from Georgia Tech. And I went and I took radiation measurements and I checked out the plant and I talked with the engineers and I checked out their safety plans and their evacuation plans. And I concluded that, hey, this is not that scary. It's actually kind of cool. And I reported back to my biology class what I had found. And that was kind of the beginning of me becoming a person who speaks publicly on this issue. Um, however, professionally, I went into the arts. Um, I studied at Appalachian State, and I was a working artist in Asheville for many years before moving to Greenville. And I actually spent almost three years working for a nonprofit called Arts for Life, which brings art to chronically and terminally ill children at Mission Hospital. And this was really a life-changing experience for me. Um, I learned two really important things during this time. One was that art is a really powerful tool. Um, some issues like cancer um, and illness are really, really difficult for us to talk about. And if you can put some sort of mediator into the conversation, like art, a tool for expression, it becomes a lot easier to get through those difficult issues. Um, the other thing that I realized when I was working at the hospital is that we really can be doing more to prevent having kids that are in the hospital all the time that are sick. And a lot of environmentalists kind of point at nuclear energy as the default of this is making our kids sick, when in fact fossil fuels are responsible for the premature deaths of approximately 25,000 Americans a year. That's like a small city getting wiped off of the planet every single year. So if you look at all of the major accidents in the history of commercial nuclear energy, there's a fraction of the lives lost for the entire history than for one year of um, use of fossil fuels. And those deaths come about in really horrible ways, things like cancer, things like heart disease and respiratory disease. And all of that could be prevented if we were a little bit smarter about how we produce our energy. But energy is a tough subject. <laughs> I mean, how many of us can claim that we have a degree in physics? I know that I can't. I don't think I would last a semester in school for engineering. And we can look at these kinds of <laughs> information, and if you don't have the tools to decipher it, it's pretty meaningless. I mean, this might as well be in Greek, right? It's literally a different language. And so I saw an opportunity in this situation to take this information, work directly with scientists and primary sources, and come up with artwork that puts it into context for the rest of us. Because we care about these issues. We care about our environment, our community, our health. And we really need to be able to make the best decisions moving forward. And so I realized that art was a great tool for addressing this very serious issue in a way that, to quote, actually is a little bit more fun and exciting and sexy. And so I want to talk a little bit more about energy in general, because I found that I think our education system isn't giving us all of the tools that we need as a society to make good decisions about energy. And this little drawing is basically a representation of electricity. It's a very simple concept. Basically, electrons moving down a conductor. It happens naturally. We've been able to essentially harness it and use it for good. Um, 
clean water, access to food, healthcare, and education, all of those things are completely dependent on access to electricity. And for anyone who's traveled outside of this country and seen what life looks like without electricity, um, it's not romantic, it's, it's not good. It's um, a lot of people suffering and struggling to survive. And you can look actually at a lot of different scientific studies and see that the links between health and prosperity are directly related to how much electricity we have access to. And at this point, we create electricity in three primary ways. The biggest and most obvious being fossil fuels. Nuclear is kind of in the middle at about 20%, and it's been there for a couple of decades now, pretty steady. And renewables are growing, um, and we're learning a lot more about them every day. So I chose this picture to share with you all because I think that it kind of highlights um, some of the good and really bad things about fossil fuels. It's amazing that you can hop on a plane and go see a friend or a family member or go have a great experience um, and you know, have that freedom and ability. And like I was saying, there are many ways that having access to energy benefits our lives. But at the same time, as you can see at the end of this runway, um, the byproducts of fossil fuels and the emissions, they don't care about the boundaries that we create. So the runway ends and it's national park and it's supposed to be protected, but it's not actually protected. There's no glass wall there. And something I have heard over and over again today is people who want to protect the natural world. But the truth is, the natural world and the industrial world are the same thing. There's just one world. And pollution and all of these difficult things to handle, they, they know no boundaries. And renewables have been this great hope, really, um, since the 70s, that they're going to come and replace fossil fuels, and we're going to live in this energy utopia, and everything's going to be fantastic, and everybody feels really good about it. The government's giving lots of money, people support it, and even the fossil fuel companies support it, which, if you ask me, is a little bit suspect. <laughs> and there's a reason that the fossil fuel industry is interested in renewables. Um, their job is to create baseload power to meet our needs all the time. Uh, it needs to be steady. So that line on the top of the graph is the amount of energy that we use day in, day out, 24-7. And we can do that with a number of different sources, uh, coal, natural gas, nuclear, and hydroelectric. But when you bring renewables into the mix for baseload power like wind, you have to be able to ramp up and down to meet the variability of renewable resources. And so the only thing that's actually capable of doing that is either hydroelectric or natural gas. And the reality of um, these new big industrial scale renewable plants is that they aren't being built on hydroelectric dams. They're being built out in other industrial spaces. And we are, in fact, just burning more fossil fuels. Now, the worst part of this is that when you ramp up and down like that, you've basically got an issue of driving on the highway on cruise control at 55 or driving in the city and braking and stopping and speeding up. And if you get to 20% capacity of renewables on our grid as it exists right now, you can actually burn more fossil fuels than if you had no renewables in the mix at all. So the, the fossil fuel industries are like, great, we'll sell you some really expensive wind and then we'll sell you even more natural gas than you were using to begin with and we're getting tons of government funding to do it. So that leaves us with nuclear, which is kind of the black sheep of the energy world. People are really scared of it. And um, I was thinking about Jimmy's talk earlier about reflections of who we are. And I think people are scared of nuclear because it is indeed a reflection of our humanity. You can use nuclear to create weapons. You can use it to create energy and you can use it to create life-saving medicines and diagnostic tools. So it's really a full reflection of all of our humanity, and it should scare us. <coughs> However, the big two issues that I've found that people are worried about with nuclear the most are meltdowns and waste. So I want to point out some new technologies to y'all that kind of amend these problems. This is the high-temperature gas-cooled reactor, which is currently being developed by the Department of Energy. This is a meltdown-proof reactor. It's small, it's rugged, and it's almost ready to replace our old fleet as well as a lot of our fossil fuel capacity. And 
the nuclear industry does listen to people's concerns. A lot of people think it's this monolithic industry that does what it wants and isn't listening, but this design is literally in response to public concerns about meltdowns. We also have a lot of waste storage solutions. Personally, I would like to see our waste be recycled and reused as fuel in next generation reactors. But for those of us who really just want to see it put into the ground, be done with it, we actually have something here in the States that was developed by the Department of Energy many decades ago. It's a proven technology for a repository called the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant. So if we needed to, we could literally just take all of our commercial waste and put it in the ground in the uh, desert of New Mexico and call it a day. And that problem is solved. So <laughs> there are a lot of misconceptions, as I learned that day when I was 15, about nuclear. And I have, as an artist, decided to work to give more information and give context to information to help us really understand what our choices are and how we should move forward. And I'm just going to kind of flash through a couple of examples. Um, I won't read them for you, but uh, of how I've been able to do this. And we basically, at my organization, create these public service an announcements. And we just distribute them and allow people to use them in any context that they would like to. And these have shown up in uh, the New York Times blog and the London Times blog and all of these different web um, resources, as well as at protest in support of different nuclear plants. So they are getting distributed, and this information is getting out there. Um, but there's a little bit more to the story. The nuclear industry right now is drawing in young, environmentally conscious people. And they, more than any generation before, are very interested in communicating with the public. And they are using art to do it. And <laughs> they kind of represent the future of this industry and what it's about and where it's going. But at the same time, this can be applied to a much broader uh, group of problems. This generation energy is just one problem that they're facing. And they need all the tools that they can to address really difficult issues that polite people would prefer not to talk about. And <laughs> art is really just a great tool for approaching these difficult issues and finding solutions to our biggest problems. And that is my idea we're spreading.